Good morning. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center. And we have with us this morning Ray Brushhart, who is the safety circuit writer for LTAP. Ray is going to be presenting a webinar for you on flagging basics for two lane roads. Just like to go over a couple of housekeeping items before I turn things over to Ray. Um, first off, if you have questions throughout the webinar, we ask that you go ahead and put those in the question pod on the GoToWebinar box that you'll see on your screen. Um, we'll be doing a question and answer period at the end of the webinar, and I'll be reading those questions off to Ray so he can respond to them. So don't hold your questions till the end. Just go ahead and put them in that webinar bo question box. The next thing is we are attempting to record the webinar. If we're successful, then you'll be provided a link to the recording afterwards. Um, if we're not, though, it's a good thing you're here live and in person to view the webinar. So I believe that's all that I have. Ray, are you ready? Yes, I am. All right. It's all yours, Ray. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Ray Brushhart, and as uh, Victoria said, I'm the safety circuit writer for the Ohio LTAP Center. And today we're going to be talking about flagging and uh, the flagging basics. And uh, of course, when you're flagging, that means you're you're on a two-lane road. If you're on a multi-lane road, uh, we don't want you out there flagging. We're going to close lanes down with uh, some other traffic control devices. Um, so let's uh, get started. So. Uh, our objectives for today's webinar is we'll go over the, the basics of flagging so that you can have a basic understanding of a flagger's qualifications and responsibilities, uh, the necessary equipment and uh, apparel for the flagger, and uh, the importance of proper flagging procedures and the signs that you need to have a good flagging operation and um, the flagger stations. And also, um, uniform flagging procedures, and how they're applied depending on the type of operation being performed, and uh, the development of good safety habits to maintain safe working conditions for employees and motorists around and through the work areas. So let's uh, begin with part one of our webinar, and that's, uh, that's an overview of flagging. So in this overview, we'll be talking about the, uh, the flaggers clothing or apparel and different flagging equipment and uh, the types different types of flagger operations we'll go over the uniform hand signals and uh, flagging devices flagging procedures the proper signs that you need and uh, how to space those signs properly and the proper flagging location and so uh, you know, we talk about tra traffic flagging. Uh, we have to realize that flaggers are critical to traffic safety. The consequences of improper flagging may be severe, and uh, flaggers have very important responsibilities. We need to know the uh, reasoning behind uh, why we have uh, a uniform way or standard way of setting up a flagging operation. It's all based upon the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, or the OMUTCD. And uh, everybody that works for a government agency should have a copy of the OMUTCD and be familiar with it. It's all about traffic control on our roadways. And, uh, you know, it talks about the proper your roadway signs, your permanent roadway signs, and your your pavement markings on the road goes over traffic signals and um, other situations that require a uniform uh, setup of traffic control, like railroad crossings and school zones and uh, things like that. So uh, each one of those situations has its own different part in the OMUTCD. And when it comes to work zones or temporary traffic control, that's all in part six of the OMUTCD. So uh, part six of the OMUTCD is, uh, is our basis for today's webinar to talk about flagging. It, uh, that manual details um, 
the standard way of setting up uh, and the requirements of a flagging operation. And uh, when you open up the part six of the OMUTCD, also called the Temporary Traffic Control Manual, uh, you'll find that towards the back of that manual, it's got about 46 different um, typical applications, they're called. And um, the flagging operation is typical application number 10, and it's titled Lane Closure on a Two-Lane Road Using Flaggers. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people depend on the flagger uh, to, for the flagger to do things correctly out there and to make sure that the flagger knows what they're doing. So here's a list of uh, people who depend upon the flagger, your, the, your workers, all the motorists, pedestrians, bikers, bicyclists, children, infrastructure, and of course the flagger, him or herself. And uh, you know, the, the name of the manual is the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And when it comes to flagging, there's uh, some uniform flagging procedures. And uh, it's not just the signs and the cones and things like that, but also the way the flagger stops traffic or releases traffic or slows traffic. There's a uniform way to do these things. You know, if if all flaggers follow the uniform procedure, then, you know, that increases safety and increases, uh, you know, the driver's awareness of the situation out there. They recognize that it's a flagging operation and there's no confusion. You know, we, don't, we definitely don't want driver confusion when it comes to uh, a flagging operation. And uh, you know, it also increases motorist respect and also promotes a uniform response uh, from the motorist. Um, in this picture, you see uh, this flagger has the flagger symbol sign um, right where they're standing instead of well in advance. So that's not a that's not definitely not the proper place for that sign. And uh, when it comes to flaggers, you know, not just anybody can be a flagger. They have to meet certain qualifications. You need to find, you know, people that have a sense of responsibility and they're, they have adequate training and safe temporary traffic control practices. They're in good physical condition. Uh, they possess mental alertness, courteous but firm manner, and have a neat appearance. And uh, they also need to stay alert at all times, face oncoming traffic, and they have to be highly visible and they need to stay out of the path of oncoming vehicles. And uh, you need to stay on the shoulder of the road out of the path of vehicles. You'll be standing at the, the start of a cone taper. You need to be able to relay information to motorists. It says to use common sense. And if you have any questions or anything, you need to contact your supervisor if you feel changes are needed to the work zone signage. The flagger's got a lot of responsibilities out there. They're responsible for his or her own safety and the safety of the workers, safety of the driving public. And flaggers need to know how to do their job correctly. And then you've got the drivers out there. And uh, as they, you have to think about what is going to be the experience of the drivers as they approach your flagging operation. You know, drivers today, you know, they might be tired or preoccupied or, you know, we call them distracted drivers these days. So we have to do our best to get their attention and guide them through the work zone safely and to protect fellow workers. Of course, controlling motorists is, uh, it can be difficult because, you know, they don't really like to be stopped when they're en route to their destination. They want to make their own decisions and be in control. They have their own expectations. We know that work zones, they can be prone to accidents or crashes, especially if they're not set up correctly. Sometimes motorists, they just feel like the flagger is in their way. And uh, so here's a list of things that can affect the driver's ability. Maybe it's the roadway uh, itself, maybe it's curves and hills things like that. Um, maybe the, the drivers are under the influence of 
alcohol or drugs, uh, the driver's age, are we dealing with a 16-year-old inexperienced driver? Maybe we're dealing with a senior citizen uh, that doesn't have very good eyesight. Uh, so the driver's experience comes into play there. Uh, the weather could affect the driver's ability, especially uh, the top picture there is showing the sun setting. You know, uh, that could have an effect on the, on the sight distance for the motorists, or maybe they're distracted looking at their phones. I think we all know, we've all seen people looking at their phones on the, as we're driving down the road. So we should never assume that a driver sees you. And so uh, let's take a look at some, uh, some pictures that we've seen over the years here at ODOT of different flaggers. Uh, here's a picture of a flagger taking it easy, sitting down in the shade. That's not where we want, that's not how we want the flagger to be. Here we have a, a flagger standing out in the middle of the road with their back turned to traffic. And uh, the flagger ahead sign is definitely not in the right location. It should be well in advance of the flagger. <clears throat> also, the flagger sign has been updated. That's a, a, the old sign that says flagger ahead. We now use a uh, a sign that has the symbol of a flagger on it. Uh, flagger control. Uh, it says when operations are such that signs, signals, and barricades do not provide the necessary protection on or adjacent to a highway or street, flaggers or other appropriate traffic controls shall be provided. Signaling, signaling directions by flaggers shall conform to the OMUTCD. So let's talk about that as we move into part two of our webinar. Probably the easiest way to remember the flagging requirements are just to remember the ABCs of flagging. So what are the ABCs of flagging? Well, the A stands for awareness or advance awareness. And B is for be visible and alert, meaning we need to make sure the flagger has the proper apparel and equipment. And C stands for communication you know, the proper way to communicate to the motorists so that we can, they know when to stop, and when to proceed, or how to slow traffic. So these are the essential aspects of any flagging operation. So let's start with our advanced warning. So the advanced warning, this is where we talk about the signs we need. You know, we don't have to guess which signs we need for a flagging operation. It says it shows it clearly in our uh, typical application number 10, which signs we need for a flagging operation. We start off the first sign that the motorist sees is the road work ahead sign. This uh, lets the public know that, you know, there is road work ahead and this uh, the first sign we give them to put them on notice that uh, things are not uh, the way they are as usual today, because uh, we've got the road crew out there working. They need to know that well in advance so they can adjust their driving accordingly, slow down and be prepared for what's ahead. You know, these are warning signs. Anytime you have a diamond-shaped sign, it's a warning sign, whether it be orange or yellow. And uh, this is the first sign that we install out there uh, for our flagging operation. These signs have to be in place before you start the flagging operation. So um, when we look at that typical application number 10, it shows us the three main signs for a flagging operation in their proper order. So you have your road work ahead sign and then your one lane road ahead sign. This tells the, the second sign always tells the motorist uh, what is the situation that lies ahead? Anytime you're driving through a work zone, you got a series of signs. You know, the second sign is where we tell them what the situation is that lies ahead. And then the third sign is the flagger symbol sign, meaning flagger ahead. So, uh, you know, the third sign in a work zone is always the sign that tells the motorists what we expect them to do. So, whether it be uh, a right lane, a symbol for a right lane closed ahead sign on a when you look on a on a freeway situation, 
but on your, when you're on a two lane road, you know, the third sign is the flag or symbol sign. So the motorist must be prepared to do what the flagger is going to tell them to do. So, and then there's a fourth sign uh, as well that uh, when you read the typical application number 10, you know, the typical applications have a, a picture of the situation showing you the signs and everything. But then there's a page that goes with that as well. And when you read that page, you'll learn that there's another sign uh, that says, be prepared to stop. And uh, that be prepared to stop sign would be placed um, as the number three sign. Uh, and that adds safety. That's a safety option in a flagging operation. So uh, the safety option are, are techniques to make your work zone uh, safer than just the standard setup. So if you're driving down a two lane state route that's got a 55 mile per hour speed limit, you always see our ODOT flagging operations with that fourth sign added, the be prepared to stop sign. We also want to draw attention to each of our signs. And uh, you know, one of the methods that we use is to place one of our newer shinier cones right beside our sign. We don't want to place it in front of the sign to block the the letters, of course, and the words, but put it right beside it. So it's just a technique to draw attention to our signs. And so uh, then we get into the the subject of how to properly space these uh, three or four different signs. And so, um, you know, the first sign, you know, we're talking about a high speed roadway, 45 and higher are uh, high speed roadways. You know, a lot of our two lane roads in Ohio are 55 miles per hour from our township roads to county roads and of course our state routes, but anything that's 45 or higher is considered to be high speed. And so if we have three signs out there, then, uh, you know, the, the first sign, the road work ahead sign is going to be 1,500 feet in front of the flaggers station. And uh, we have this uh, table here that uh, we created, the recommended advanced warning sign minimum spacing. And so, you know, when we're flagging, it's usually in a rural area. So when we look at this table, it shows us that there are four basic road types out there from our urban low speed roads, urban high speed, rural and expressway freeway. So if we look at the rural situation, we'll see that uh, the distance between each sign in that sign series is 500 feet. So that's how we came up with the 1500 feet in advance. And then so the one lane road ahead, which is the second sign would be a thousand feet uh, in advance of the flagger station. And then the flagger ahead or flagger symbol sign would be 500 feet. And uh, of course those sign, uh, the spacings would be, the spacings would still be 500 if we added that fourth sign. So if we had the fourth sign, then uh, the first sign would be 2000 feet in front of the flaggers uh, station. And what that does for the high speed situation at four sign is it creates more advanced warning, plus it adds 500 feet more of queuing space uh, for stopped vehicles. And uh, when you're flagging, the last thing you want to have is for the stopped vehicles to queue back um, before your very first sign. <clears throat> that would be a dangerous situation because you know, as people approach uh, that queue of traffic, then there would be no signs to warn them of, of stop traffic ahead. So, you know, if you throw in some curves and hills along the way, you can imagine how, you know, that could uh, be a very dangerous situation. So that's why the fourth sign is uh, very important uh, to increase the safety there on our high speed two lane rural roads.
So uh, here's a, a picture of obviously a lower speed roadway because uh, those signs are closer together. But uh, it's important to uh, have this visual aspect there for the motorists when they see all these signs lined up. They can see each sign in advance as they approach you. <clears throat> the 100 feet apart, as they're shown in that picture, would be uh, for a low speed urban situation. <clears throat> so that speed limit there is probably like 35 miles per hour in that picture. So spacing is definitely important. You know, you have to picture in your mind as you know, the motor is traveling at, at that speed. You know, so each speed has a different spacing. And so let's talk about how we set up these signs. You know, before we can, uh, our crew can start working on the roads, we got to set up this flagging operation. So let's talk about uh, the method for how we set up these signs. So as we, as we're out there, usually in the morning, we're setting up the flagging operation. We're going to set up the signs um, furthest from the work area first. So we're we're just setting up the signs with the flow of traffic. And it says that we must be aware of obstructions or reduced visibility, you know, things that uh, hamper the sight distance of the motorist. And so as we are setting up these signs, it's not a flagging operation yet because we don't have the signs in place. So what it is, it's a mobile operation. <clears throat> and so there's a different typical application for that as well. It's number 17. It's a mobile operation on a two lane road. And uh, maybe you're lucky enough to have a nice wide shoulder on the roadway for the for the sign guys to get out of the the road and out of the way of traffic. But as we know, in Ohio, not all of our two lane roads have shoulders. So sometimes you have to actually block a lane of traffic as you're stopped to, to install your signs. And so that's why it's important to have your high intensity flashing strobes on your work vehicle uh, turned on and maybe even have a shadow truck as well for those high speed situations. So you need to follow typical application number 17. Uh, while you're setting up your signs. And so, um, you know, this is talking about, this slide here is talking about our channelizing devices. So you're probably going to be using cones. Uh, sometimes you might be using our orange barrels or the drums. So as you look at this uh, table here, that uh, is titled Maximum Spacing of Channelizing Devices in Feet, we take a look at that. Uh, the line for two lane road, as we're setting up the taper, our cone taper to close off that lane of traffic, then the proper spacing of these cones is 20 feet in the taper. And then as you get past the taper, you're into your buffer space and workspace, then you can increase the spacing of your cones to be uh, a maximum spacing of two times the speed limit. So if your speed limit was 45, you could have a maximum spacing of 90 feet in that area between the cones or 110 feet. Um, so you have to think to yourself, you know, is that going to be too far apart and people might be trying to drive in between the cones? If so, then, uh, you know, you can put the cones closer together. You can put your cones side by side if you want, if you got that many cones, but uh, this table just talks about the maximum spacing. And then the downstream taper is the, the taper for at the very end of the work zone uh, to show the motorist that they can get back over and resume, resume their normal driving. So the type of taper we use for a flagging operation, it's a very short taper compared to all the other types of tapers that we have. There's um, four types of tapers that we use in work zones. But as we look at this table, we see that uh, the second column is titled two lane roads. So there's only one type of taper for a two lane road. And that is our 
<clears throat> our two-way taper it's called and so as you can see that no matter what the speed limit is for this taper from 25 up to 70 of course we're mainly dealing with 55 45 to 55 miles per hour on our two-lane roads in our rural areas we'll see that the length of that taper is 50 foot minimum to 100 foot maximum so it's a relatively short taper when you compare it to like a merging taper that would be anywhere from 540 feet to 660 feet for uh, 45 to 55 miles per hour. So here's a good uh, drawing of a two-lane road that has a flagging operation set up for it. So it says first we're going to place the advance warning signs in the unaffected lane and then the closed lane. So you have your your first sign you're putting up is for the in this picture the southbound lane, and uh, so that's going to be your uh, road work ahead sign. And then the second we're going to place the yeah, then we have the signs for the northbound lanes, and then we begin our taper uh, to place the channelizing devices with the flow of traffic. And uh, and continue with that until you're you're done place, placing all the cones. And then to at the end of the your when the work is finished and we want to remove the traffic control devices, we remove them against the flow of traffic so it says when no longer needed we either lay your devices down your signs down or place at a 90 degree angle to the traffic uh, even at lunchtime you know if you're if you're breaking for lunch and uh, you're no longer going to be out there working then we want to make sure that uh, you know we don't have signs up there telling the motorists that the, we have a lane closed uh, when we actually don't. <clears throat> it says that motorists re lose respect for signs are left up when no workers are present, and this may influence their behavior in the future. So if you're not out there working, then we need to put our signs down. So first we remove uh, the channeling devices against the flow of traffic, and then we, from there, you continue to remove the warning sign so that the last sign removed was the first sign installed or the road work ahead sign. So that's uh, how we handle our uh, the the advanced warning area and uh, for our work zone for the flagging operation. So then we move on to remember we're talking about the ABC. So next is the B for be visible and alert. So let's here's where we talk about the proper flagging apparel and uh, flagger devices. So if you're a flagger, you want to make sure that the public sees you. You want to, should be uh, seen at least a thousand feet in advance, if that's possible. And so we need you to have the proper clothing and equipment. And at ODOT, we require all of our employees to wear a Fluorescent yellow green safety vest that meets the ANSI standard of 107 2002 when flagging. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's very important that the motorist, when they see the flagger symbol sign, they should, from that point, be able to see you. And uh, that's not the case here in this picture. It's hard to find the flagger here. So, this is definitely not the way to do it correctly. Uh, they, you know, there's a lot of things wrong with this picture. So, you know, they have the stop slow paddle jammed down into a an old uh, tar covered cone, um, and there's no buffer space. We'll talk about the buffer space here coming up, and then the flagger is actually standing behind a work truck. So, you know, how is the motor supposed to even know that? So that's not a, definitely not the proper way to do that. So let's talk about the proper clothing or apparel that the flagger should be wearing. It should be wearing a high visibility 
fluorescent yellow green uh, safety vest with a contrasting collar of either orange, yellow, yellow green. And uh, if you're out there in the daytime, you have to meet class two requirements. At ODOT, we, we require our flaggers to wear a hard hat. And uh, so it's up to your agency to determine if that's going to be your policy. Uh, and if it's a uh, nighttime flagging, then you would be required to meet the standards for ANSI class three for your apparel. So it's more retro reflective and it usually includes trousers. And uh, you can read more about uh, the flagging requirements in the OMUTCD part six section 6e.02 which is on page 647. So here's what our stop slow paddles look like for the flagger to have. So the uh, on the on the stop part of this stop slow paddle the we have the uh, the word stop is in a, a white legend on a red background. And the slow is a black legend on orange background. And it's retro reflectorized, especially for night use. And the letters uh, or the signs should be at least 18 inches by 18 inches. But if you're on a, on a higher speed roadway, it should be 24 by 24 minimum. And uh, so the letter is at least six inches high. You can increase the size for added visibility. And uh, Stop slow paddle should be at least five to seven feet high. The rigid handle and always a good condition. So the proper equipment you should have is a standard stop slow paddle. If it's an emergency situation, then you're allowed to use red flags until the stop slow paddle becomes available. Uh, it's a good idea to have a, a air horn or a like a referee's whistle, so you can uh, warn your coworkers if uh, if someone's going to be running past or driving past the flagger when you're trying to stop them, or an out of control motorist. Uh, you should have a two-way radio for communicating with the other flagger. Uh, it's good to have a pad and pencil in case you got to write down any information, like somebody's driver's license. And then also some personal comfort items like sunglasses, drinking water, rain gear, sunscreen, etc. Now, where does the flagger stand as they're out there flagging? So there is a preferred flagger location on the shoulder of the roadway at the beginning of the cone taper. We don't want you standing out in the path of moving vehicles. You know, um, this flagger is definitely not standing in the proper location. Um, so you know, the only time you would you would go out into the lane of traffic is after you have uh, a vehicle or two stopped. Maybe it's a larger vehicle so that the approaching motorists, they can't see you because of the larger vehicle. So then you can move out uh, near the center line so that they can see you in the stop slow paddle. So here's a here's a picture uh, showing the the two-way traffic taper. Again, it's 50 to 100 foot max, and uh, so you you would want to have um, at least six cones uh, in this uh, type of taper. And again, the maximum spacing is 20 feet apart. So in that situation, what it looks like is a wall of cones from a distance, that's what it looks like to the approaching motorist. So that in itself, when they see that wall of cones, uh, then they, you know, see that and immediately start to slow down. That's the theory behind that. So let's talk about another safety feature here that we need to include when we're in high speed traffic. And uh, that's the buffer space. So in this picture, you see the buffer it's a totally empty space between the flagger and the actual workspace. And the length of this buffer space is related to the 
approach speed and road conditions, and it's always empty. There's no equipment stored there. There's no vehicles parked there and definitely no people there. It's, it's there for the errant motorist to, uh, to get things under control before they run into anything or anybody. So this is how we determine the buffer space length. And so um, you got your speed in miles per hour and then the distance in feet. Um, so there you, you know, we're talking about 335 feet minimum uh, for a buffer space. We're at 55 miles per hour. And so uh, you know, we got to have that distance for, um, for the motorist to be able to come to a complete stop uh, in that area before they crash into anybody or anything. And then at the end of that buffer space, to make it even extra safe, we can uh, put in a crash attenuator uh, at the end of that. So if you approach a, an ODOT flagging operation, that's what uh, you're going to see. So if ODOT's doing it, then, you know, as a local government, you should be thinking that, you know, you should, you should do that as well. So uh, again, you're separating the flagger from the workers. You got the, the motorist has enough room to stop before entering the work area. It gives the workers a few extra seconds to react, which is critical. And um, if there are curves in the road, the flagger station should be extended to allow additional stopping time. So here's a good uh, drawing of a flagging operation that's uh, set up correctly. So you have your advanced warning area, then you have your transition area. Every work zone has these different parts, an advanced warning area, a transition area, the activity area, which includes the buffer space and workspace. And then over here is the traffic space that the traffic is actually driving in. And then you have your termination area, which includes the downstream taper and another sign at the end that says, uh, you know, end of work or uh, end road work. And this picture shows an example of where the flagger should be standing if we're dealing with a horizontal curve or even a vertical curve. So the, the flagger and the taper are all uh, in advance of the curve in the straight section of the roadway along with the signs. And then so the buffer space is then extended around the curve uh, so we, we don't surprise the motorists as they drive around the, the curve. You know, we want the, again, the signs and the flagger and the taper to be visible to the motorists. And then we come up to the section of C for communication. So, like I said, there is a, a standard way to communicate to the motorists when we're a flagger. Uh, a flagger is considered to be a legal traffic control device that must be obeyed. And so we have three basic flagging skills, skills for stopping traffic, releasing traffic, and slowing traffic. And uh, it says to stop traffic, we're going to be standing on the, again, on the shoulder of the roadway at the beginning of the cone taper. And we've got the stop part of the sign displayed. Uh, with our right hand and our left hand is raised up with the palm facing the motorist. To re release traffic, we switch the sign to slow and uh, and she's uh, waving her, you know, pumping her hand up and down uh, to, to show the drivers to slow down as they proceed. Okay. You always want to make sure you establish eye contact with that motorist to make sure that they see you there. It's very that is very important. And it says here to you you may move towards the center line after a few vehicles have stopped. Um, again, if you, uh, you have a large vehicle stopped at the beginning of the queue, maybe the vehicles approaching can't see you, so that's why you would uh, move out close to the center line so they can see you and the stop slow paddle. 
and then you make sure you return to the shoulder before releasing the traffic. Again, we never stand in front of oncoming or moving traffic. And so uh, when we release traffic, again, we're remaining on the shoulder. The, the slow part of the sign faces traffic. You're making eye contact with the drivers and use your free hand to direct drivers to the proper lane. And we do not wave the sign at drivers that might confuse them. Sometimes you don't need to stop traffic as they approach, so we just want to slow them down. And uh, to do that, we display the slow, and you use your free arm to motion traffic to slow down, moving your, your hand up and down slowly. And uh, again, you're on the shoulder and not in the path of the oncoming traffic. So that's the ABCs of flagging. And so let's move on to a third part of our webinar talk about the different flagger operations you know the most common is the two flagger operation where we have a flagger at one end of the work zone uh, for one lane of traffic and a, another flagger at the other end and uh, so you, this is how it works the first flagger is showing the sign as slow and the second flagger has their sign on stop and he continues to stop traffic until he receives the all clear from the first flagger, either from uh, from the radio or from a, a signal, if they can see each other. <sighs> so, uh, you know, we, we never have arrow boards turned on in a, in, with an arrow in a flagging operation. As you look at this, there's a picture of typical application number 10. There's no arrow board in this picture. Um, so that, that would uh, detract the motor's attention from the flagger and they would be looking at the arrow board. If it was on arrow mode, and you know, they might assume that they can just keep going and that's not the case. So communication between flaggers, uh, if you can see each other, it's, it's good that, uh, you can see each other at all times and you have your signals prepared in advance for stopping and releasing or the most common is with two-way radios uh, and if you can't see each other maybe there's multiple flaggers if you have some intersections in between the, the two main flaggers so you always always want to make sure you have fully charged batteries at the beginning of your shift flag carrying method this uh, usually isn't done in Ohio but it may be in rare cases where we have a, a, a really long flagging operation like uh, sometimes if a uh, township trustees are chipping and sealing a roadway like a mile at a time maybe you have a flag carrying method but we usually prefer uh, um, a uh, the method where we have a, a pilot vehicle instead of that. Uh, the pilot vehicle is, uh, is safer, it's easier, and you don't have to worry about a motorist keeping your flag. So um, a single flagger operation is, uh, it's okay, but you have to meet these conditions for a single flagger operation. Low volume, good visibility in both directions, and it's only for when you have a really short workspace so, and you're out there for just a short duration, uh, which is less than an hour. And it's really, we prefer the lower speed. So if it's high speed, we want you to use two flaggers. So if you are in a single flagger operation, you would actually stand directly across from the workspace on the shoulder of the road, never in the path of, of the moving traffic and you're controlling traffic from both directions. So here's some pictures of a single flagger operation. You can see the, the flagger has a stop slow paddle over on the shoulder of the road. He's got cones on both sides of him to draw attention to him. And of course he has the uh, proper flagging apparel on as well. So there's some different pictures there. And um, so as the, if you have a a volume of significant volume of traffic then that's another reason to have two flaggers out there instead of one 
Then there's nighttime flagging. Of course, flagging at night sometimes is necessary, but to do this, you have to have some uh, more equipment with you, like uh, a flashlight with a glow cone. Uh, your vest has to be a type three. You might want trousers as well. Your uh, stop slow paddle has to be retro reflectorized and uh, you would be required to have auxiliary lighting shining on the flagger. Um, this section talks about flagging during emergencies. Emergency flagging, uh, this is a non-scheduled events, might be a, a crash or a water main break. Um, this is where you could be using flags, but they have to, the flags have to meet the requirements of a 24 inch square, red in color, not orange, and weighted on one end to keep from blowing in high winds. Another emergency, what if, if a, an EMS squad shows up as you're out there flagging? So you wanna do your best to allow them to ride away as soon as possible. But you know, sometimes you might actually have to stop that EMS squad depending on what's going on. So uh, you have to think about that as you're out there. And so uh, you have to, as a flagger, anticipate the unexpected, be prepared to respond, and also remember to protect yourself. You know, you gotta be able to think about your escape route uh, in the emergency situations. And then of course, warn other flaggers and workers, try to prevent other vehicles from entering the work zone. Uh, if it was caused by a, you know, somebody not respecting you, uh, zooming past you, then try to do your best to record a description of the vehicle and license plate, notify your supervisor. And then you do that in, in this order. So uh, you know, types of, of emergencies could be, like I said, a driver disobeying your command or crash. Might be a crash. And uh, then we have the situation with hostile drivers. So like I said, not every driver wants to be stopped. They want to be in command. They might get angry. When this happens, you know, you have to realize that you are in command. We don't want you to abandon your post. Be polite but brief. Keep a safe distance and be courteous but firm. And so uh, remember that flagging is a very important job. You need to stay alert at all times facing oncoming traffic. Be visible and you're, you're not there standing where the work is taking place. You're well in advance of the work uh, alone on the shoulder of the roadway. Okay, so remember the ABCs, awareness, be visible and alert and uh, communicating properly. So before we get to questions, I wanted to also show everybody some resources for flight on our Ohio LTAP page. Uh, on, on our Ohio LTAP homepage, we have our um, some resources here. We have our YouTube channel uh, where you can find a good flagging training video and uh, hundreds of other training videos. And over here on the right side of our page, we have different things to click on, one of which is our resources and programs uh, for uh, some really good, quick information for flagging. When you're on our resources and programs page, you can scroll down, go to our route of navigation, or RON series. So we have a, a series of jobs for local governments. If you click on this, then uh, you see if you scroll down, we have a, a long list of different categories for our RON updates, we call them. And down at the bottom in alphabetical order, we have work zone safety. And uh, if you click on that, we have one titled designing your flagging operation. And all you gotta do is uh, click right there. And uh, it's got a lot of the information that I just went over. It's got, uh, talks about the OMUTCD and uh, part six of the OMUTCD, the Temporary Traffic Control Manual. It uh, has all the typical application number 10, uh, lane closure on two lane road using flaggers, talks about all the requirements from that. Also has the picture of it 
showing you the signs and the sign spacing, proper location for the flagger, and uh, what else to do? It goes over the different uh, guidance and options of how to make it safer, the sign spacing, and uh, it also goes on into detail about the differences between a 55 mile per hour roadway and a 35 mile per hour roadway and the, the, how different a flagging operation looks for those different speeds because your signs are spaced differently and uh, a different length of buffer space. And so that's a very good uh, job aid for how to set up your flagging operation. And also on our YouTube page, if you clicked on that YouTube icon, one of the things you can do, see what I have here. If you click on, here's our Ohio LTAP Center YouTube channel. Once you click on playlists right here, a couple of things, you got our webinars, like uh, Victoria said, we're gonna post this webinar on our YouTube channel. But we, you can view other U, uh, webinars as well. I, did a webinar, um, a question and answer webinar about work zones. It's on that list. Another thing you can do is up here in the search box, you can type in flagging plus Virginia. You know, it's hard to find good training videos for flagging, but I found one that is uh, the most recent flagging training video I found. It's from the state of Virginia, their Department of Transportation. Uh, produced a flagging training video. So if you type that in there and hit the search box, the search button, it's right here at the top. So you got your VDOT flagger training video. And so if you, uh, you could watch uh, this video here, it's only, it's less than 20 minutes long and it's a very informative uh, flagging training video. So those are a couple uh, different resources there. And, um, for you and your road crews, if you're in a pinch for some flagger training, I highly recommend all those. So, uh, so let's go ahead then, and uh, I'll open it up for questions. Okay, Ray, we've got one question in the question pod, and this individual wants to know if all three of the advance warning signs are required each time. Well, you know. Each situation is kind of different. I mean, it depends on what you're doing, but uh, the, the manual tells us that if you're gonna be out there for more than an hour, then you definitely need uh, all the signs. Uh, if it's uh, less than an hour, you know, if like a 15 minute job or something like that, then, um, you know, you might get by with less signs, but you have to, when you do that, then you have to have your high intensity strobes turned on and possibly um, a shadow vehicle as well with uh, with their lights on as well, their strobes, high intensity strobes. And of course, it, you know, you have to exercise some, some judgment as far as the sight distance for approaching motorists. So, you know, if we're dealing with hills and curves, you know, those, uh, those lights won't mean much if uh, they don't see the lights until they come around a curve and see them right then. So if uh, if sight distance is obstructed, then it's possible that you would need all those signs. So, uh, so hopefully that answers your question. Hopefully it does. And that was the only question we had in the chat pod. So you've done a great job today with the webinar, Ray. We want to thank you. And we want to thank you for the additional resources and thank everyone who joined us today. As long as the recording is successful, we will be sending out a link to everyone um, after the webinar is completed. Since we don't have any other questions in the chat pod, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up today. I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Are you still there, Victoria?